Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Romans and chapter 4. Yes, that's right. You heard correctly. Not Genesis. Uh, today um, is the, finals, the final day in our little mini-series we've been doing looking at faith, which has been mainly based in Genesis. I'm very excited that next week Travis is going to be um, taking point on doing a major series looking at the book of Romans. Can I have a woo? And looking at uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. Um, let's go! And so I, I, and I, and I was thinking about, you know, we've been looking at this whole thing of faith. Uh, looking at the life of Abraham particularly. And uh, I was drawn to the fact that the, the preceding verses to 5, 6, 7, 8 are Romans 4. And, um, and they talk about Abraham. And they kind of demonstrate my my point to us, which has been that this great man of the Old Testament, unless you spend unhurried time in your life meditating and imagining, say imagining, imagining what it would have been like to be him in this great story that really kind of is a foundation for the entire rest of the Bible. If you don't do that, if it's not real to you, if it isn't alive to you, if it's not something that you've spent time thinking about, in many ways, the rest of the Bible almost doesn't quite have the power that God wanted to have. So this is actually a perfect kind of uh, connection now into this great Everest in the New Testament that we're going to be attempting to scale over the next few weeks together, which is Romans. Um, but it really is um, a book that makes so much sense when you have done what we've been doing, which is looking at the man of Abraham and Sarai, his wonderful wife. And We've been making the point that as a church, um, we are wanting to at least attempt to not live by sight, not live walking in fear, and not live hearing only the voices of this world. That this book compels us to actually, if we call ourselves a Christian, no matter how fragile and weak and wobbly you feel, that actually to be a believer means that we are those who are committed, like Abraham, like Sarai, like the rest of the people in this great book, to following God more and more walking by faith, not walking according to just what we think would make sense. It's a big difference, right? Huge difference. We've been learning that. And hearing not just MTV, our kids' screams, our husband and wife or her wife's plea to us to do something, but hearing the voice of God, and seeing the situations around us, particularly when they're famine-like situations, when things are not what we would hope them to be, rather than seeing them just with fear, seeing them with what? Say it with me. Faith. We've been learning that, and I do, I do personally feel that the atmosphere has been changing. It's not just a kind of, um, you know, an excitement but there's a, a deposit, I believe, the Father has been putting into our feeble frames that as we look at this, we are fully convinced that as a people of God, individually and together, it is our destiny, whatever that looks like for you in your apparently normal domestic life, to be a person of faith, for us to be a church of faith. There isn't really another option because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I really have done my best to appeal to our minds and our bodies and our spirits and everything that you are that this is important. But not in a heavy kind of uh, way, in a way to encourage you to make your life a little bit more rocket fueled. That whatever it is, whether you're going to Tulare, whether you're staying in faith, whether you're going to start to lead a pack, whether you're going to join a pack, whether you're brand new here and this kind of church freaks you out, but you think, I'm going to give it another week. All of us have got our next step faith moments. Amen? That's the point. And seeing it with eyes of faith is what God's been doing. And today, I'm not going to actually add a new new kind of action for us. This final thing I want us to look at that I believe is really key 
It's more how we do those three steps that we've already touched upon. The seeing, the hearing, the walking. Because you can, in theory, do those things, but what we learn from Romans 4 with this final section today is that we see this manner, this flavor, this way in which Abraham and Sarai listened by faith, walked by faith, and saw by faith. And I've called it not wavering by faith, because that's the translation we have here. There's something we see in these and this amazing couple here, that is not just about doing it right, but it's the way that we're doing it. What does it mean to waver? Well, obviously, to waver, James, the book of James, talks about being double-minded. It means that you, you go and you oscillate between one thing and another. And of course, none of us would ever call it that, right? None of us here are ever guilty of wavering. No, we're just thorough. We just like to keep our options open, Tom. I'm just level-headed. I'm not an enthusiast like you are more grounded. That's what we call it. But is it possible that that is actually a delusion? And actually, we are at times guilty of wavering. And today, what we see, and I love this picture. Again, turn on your imagination machines, your brains, as we read these scriptures, because this picture is so, it's actually quite comical, but it's beautiful. It's so wonderful. This older couple Deliberately older, okay? Deliberately. So no, no matter how old you are here, there's no excuse. There's no running away. There's no like, oh, well, we're just settling down. No, no, no. The whole point of this story is that it leads all of us into a place of uncomfortable yet exciting adventures in faith. And what we're going to see here in these few verses is this is simple final point that Paul is making hundreds of years later after it originally happened. And he's saying to them, it's not just to see, it's not enough just to see by faith or hear or walk, but the way that you do it with a kind of confidence, with a kind of resolve, with a non-waveringness is absolutely vital. Read with me here from verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so, this is what happened because he was faithful. He became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. (laughs) Since he was about 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver. Say, did not waver. He did not waver through unbelief. Wow. Are you wavering because of ultimately not trusting and believing? Regarding the promise of God, but, here we go, was strengthened in his faith gave glory to God, being fully persuaded, fully persuaded, super confident, that God was, sorry, that God had power to do what he had promised, and this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. He was fully persuaded. I love this picture, this image of this old couple who their bodies are, it's pretty blunt, isn't it? As good as dead. It's not exactly very flattering language. It's not just their bodies weren't in their prime, but, you know, the, 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 the gray hairs were wonderful. You know, they were really, they really suited Abraham. He's like, your body's dead. There you go. So it's God wants to make it incredibly sure. You know, whatever your equivalent is, maybe it's literally you feel like your body's dead. Or you just, there's this, there is this thing that disqualifies me, Tom. This thing that disqualifies me. You don't know me. You're some crazy weird Englishman, and you really don't know my life. I have this big, disqualifying, dead type thing in my life, which means I can come to the church. I can sort of be connected with the church, but I'm not going to be one of those faith-filled people that you seem to talk about. And the enemy gets us. He creeps in with a sneaky lie. And actually, our father today says, don't do that. Please don't do that. Look at the picture. Picture it in your mind. Oh, come on, love. Off on a bit of an adventure. We're going to wander off into the desert. No idea where we're going. Let's go. Come on. 
It's madness, I say. It's glor- glorious madness. I love this. Fully persuaded. I love this. I get this image of like, you know, I don't know what Abraham looked like, but this sort of glint in his eye. He's confident. Has anyone seen that film, I Feel Pretty? You know, there's a bit, Renee, the stories of, of a lady with a very average body who gets bonked on the head and then gets fully persuaded that she looks amazing. It's a brilliant film. And I kind of get this, this it's almost a bit like that. There's this kind of logically, like, why is he so confident that this is going to happen? Come on, Sarai. But they're persuaded in God. And God doesn't despise that. He doesn't despise that. It is actually almost childlike. You see that? Do you see that there? I love that. There's, it's not childish. Some of you are so deluded that growing in faith is this ever-growing mass of theological stuff in your brain. And you're so cynical. You're just like, mm, it's constipated in the faith. You're not doing anything. You're just like, mm. man. I want to ask for a show. And Lord, he did, they're just like, woo! Fully persuaded. Psh, no idea how it's going to happen. I love that. I identify with that. Come on, you Americans, you identify with that. Put your hand in the air like you just don't care. There's this beautiful just sense of there is no logical reason why this should work. But I'm so fully persuaded. And, and it just, I love it. It's like, man, he was credited as righteous. It was important. It wasn't just this, this preordained plan that was just going to always... It was important that he did that. Guys, your heart really matters. It really matters. Today is the day the Lord has made. And he's saying, come on, join with me. Don't let that, that equivalent thing discount you, my friends. There's a world awaiting for us. Amen? There's a world. Teleri is waiting. It's like, ah, come on. The ends of the earth are waiting for us. It's amazing what God wants to do through a very average people. <laughs> and um, I love it. And, and so because he's fully persuaded, I love this, he doesn't waver. Now let me ask you this. Do you think it's important that you don't waver? I'll ask you that question, really. Do you think it's important? Listen, it's not so much doing it. It's also, can I put it in this way? It's the speed with which you do it. It's the decisiveness with which you do it. It's this feel. It's not just, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm open. It's interesting. Yeah, God might have spoken. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe. You know, I've, I, I, might, I might be seeing this in the right way. And of course, I'm not saying just be a, like a headless crazy chicken who just, you know, does things without thinking. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, okay? You're a mature bunch. You get it. What I am saying, though, is he's getting at something that can hide under the banner of discernment and, you know, what they did was kind of mad. It's kind of mad. It wasn't a strategic plan. It wouldn't, we would have probably, if we'd known them, we would have like, guys, no disrespect. You're, you're, why, where you? We're going off to start a nation. You'd be like, have you heard about Abraham and Sarai? They've gone mad. They're leaving here and they're going to wander in the desert to start a nation. <laughs> uh, what? Help them. Talk to them. Be a friend. Talk them down. They're like, Come on, honey, we're off. I love it. Now, doesn't the church need that? I'm so, doesn't it? Come on. If you've just got dragged down by just this kind of, mm, there's, there is a sense of, you know, the word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word entheos, which means God inside. Isn't that beautiful? God inside. Come on, some of you, your heart has grown a little dim and God's saying, come on, I'm, I'm calling you to be like them. And, and, and so this idea of not wavering. And right now, as I'm saying this, I know for many of you, your heart is, there's a sense of you going, yeah, there's this thing I haven't done. And I know I need to do it. I'm a bit scared. It's okay. I've got these things in me that discount me. It's okay. Yes, face the fact. Your body's as good as dead. You can't do it. Don't pretend you can. You can't. But if the Lord's calling you, then he gets a lot of glory when you can't do it, and everyone knows you can't do it. It's not just that you privately think I'm not up to this. Everybody's like, they can't do it. It's very public. It's like, it's so vulnerable. But listen, if you, if you have ever had that moment in your life, you've seen it on TV when there's a, a relationship coming and one person says to the other, I love you for the first time. 
If the other person wavers for even a moment, it's game over, right? You can go, I love you too. And you know, shut up, you're lying. <laughs> you're like, the pause destroys it. The pause is the condemnation, right? Listen, our tender father, he says, I've made you a promise. Will you trust me? And I think what we see in Abraham and Sarah is that they say right back, we're in. We're not going to overthink this. We sense that you're saying this to us and we are not going to waver. I love you. Actions speak so much louder than words. I think it's this romance that he's talking about here. Listen, we all waver at times. Abraham gets it wrong. But there's this fundamental commitment to not wavering. I'm in. I love you. And so, if you may have picked up in this series that I've been fairly enthusiastic, fairly involved emotionally, and it's because this series has not just been a series, it's been a theological walk for me. Um, this series has been very, very autobiographical and very sort of personal. For those of you who don't know us, we moved a year ago from England after two years of build-up. and So this whole moving thing has been hugely, you know, hearing by faith, walking by faith, seeing by faith. It's been like, oh, yeah, we get it. Um, but I don't know how else to say this, really, apart from that for us, I guess, for us to not waver means that today it is actually with an excitement, but also a very real sadness that we are of announcing that as far as we can tell, uh, the Lord is calling us to, after term finishes in the summer for the kids, to take our next step um, and to move and church plant in the city of San Francisco. Yeah. Thank you. I've been very nervous about telling you. Um, <laughs> um, I feel so many emotions. I just want to, Trav's going to say a few words in a minute. I just want to just very quickly ask three questions you might be thinking. Why SF, first of all? Uh, why are we telling you now if it's not for nine months, ten months? And then just, what does it mean, thirdly? For Radiant, okay? And just to say, we clearly are not going to have all the answers for you in the next 25 minutes. Um, and we're going we're gonna to produce a letter for the members to try and anticipate some questions over the next few weeks. There'll be another members night in the next few months, no doubt, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this in more detail. So this is just kind of the headline, really. Um, some of you won't know who the heck we are, and you'll be like, oh, I don't care. Who are you? <laughs> um, and that's really actually strangely great. <laughs> um, and some of you will be excited, and some of you will be a mix. A lot of you will be a mix. I, I, certainly, that's where we are. Um, I don't think I anticipated feeling such love for so many people so quickly. I didn't. And it's not just me being nice. I really didn't. You. <laughs> um, but that is the reality, and um, I'm not very good at hiding things particularly when God's telling us to do something. Um, so, um, yeah, so what, first of all then, what, why San Francisco, Tom? <laughs> why? Um, I think w before we actually came here, we had a couple of, like, prophetic words. One about a port. One, a guy called Lee Yarbrough, who's based in Mexico, two or three years ago when uh, he knew that there was a chance of us moving to California and that Visalia was going to be where we're going to land. He said, I, I feel like you're going to be there for a season. It's going to be vital. But there may be a next step. And I see your name's Tom Shaw. And a play on words, Shaw. I think God might move you to a port on the shore. And that there'll be a, a work that you're going to be involved there. That you're going to lead that will be like boats coming in, going out. Lots of coming and equipping and being sent. And I was like, cool. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you, Lee. That's great. And then uh, a great friend of mine called Mike um, prophesied the summer before we came about San Francisco. He'd been to a trip in Hawaii 15 years ago. On the way back, he'd flown through SF. And as he went through the airport, the Holy Spirit said to him, 
I'm going to give you land here. And it was very, very shocking. He forgot about it for 15 years, and then I tell him that we feel God's calling us to California, and he doesn't want to go, but he, the Spirit rushes on him again and saying, remember that? That's for Tom. It's for your spiritual son. So he didn't really want to tell me that because he kind of confirmed <laughs> us going, but he did. But I remember when he told me, I was like, oh, okay, cool. I've heard of San Francisco. It sounds like you know, a nice place. But this is the deal. It was quite strange in a way because I felt no emotion. I, didn't feel, I, was, I felt very detached from it because I'd been to Visalia. I knew Trav and Tiff. I knew the elders. I knew the, getting to know this church. I am not a big city guy at all by nature. You know, Canterbury is a third the size of Visalia. And we lived in the countryside near Canterbury. You know, I'm a country boy by nature. I love wandering around the fields and, you know, pondering Jesus. I'm not, I'm not like some, you know, it's not me. So these words came, and I was like, okay, well, you know, you don't despise prophecy, right? So you just keep it there. But I didn't feel like an attachment to it at all. Then we came in last summer, and at Christmas, we decided to go to San Francisco just for a couple of days over Christmas. And uh, I remember JR, um, many of you know JR. JR is a, a businessman amongst many things. Uh, brilliant businessman. And he was like, oh, you'll love it up there. You'll love it. It's great. You should go. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go. We'll go. So we go up. And um, to my great surprise, as we drive into the city, I suddenly feel incredibly emotional. Now, I know what you're saying. <laughs> that means nothing, Tom. <laughs> But actually, it does. Um, I get emotional about genuinely things that God puts in my heart. And as I drove in to this city, over those four days, four or five days, something just involuntarily was happening in my spirit. And partly, it felt a little bit like Europe. You know, very mixed politically, very small houses compared with here, public transport, it's all very expensive, you know. I was like, oh, this, this feels strangely like, like Europe. But something in me was quite profoundly happening that just went on for day after day after day. We were there for four or five days. And I was like, wow, this isn't even entirely comfortable. It's kind of like there's something being birthed or something in me. And at the end of that, those few days, I, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you are not to talk about this. You know, Mary pondered the things up in her heart. I felt him say, you're to do that which if any of you know me, is not my style. I like to talk. So I was like, this has got to be God if God's saying, don't talk about it. But I remember like, with the day we got back, we went again over to Jerry and Kinley's, and um, <laughs> Jerry was like, hey, just look, making some food. Had, did you have a good time? Do you like the city? And I was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was good. <coughs> it was good. And started crying. And he looked at me and was like, oh, you're going to move there, aren't you? You're going to start a church there. Right? And I was like, what the crap? Shut up! Like, and I, it's just JR being JR, you know, like, is the food ready? And, and, I, was, and I, was, I was uncomfortable um, and a little bit confused, but I, I, I felt over those next three months, God just saying, just let, let it stew in your heart. And then April came. Oh, April, what a month. April was a very interesting month. There was a specific Thursday. I'll never forget it. When I, I left the offices at the end of the day, and as I got into the car, it was really specific. The Holy Spirit said, beep, boop. Well, he didn't do that noise, but he went like, Shh. He just said, right, permission granted for you now to start considering what I've got for you next. And on that same afternoon... I had an email from a friend of mine who lives in the UK, who works in China a lot, who randomly emailed me, who knew nothing about any of this, because no, I haven't told anyone, apart from Josie. Um, and he emailed me and said, hey, Tom, I'm going to be in California in about a month. Um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm going to be in San Francisco. I'd love to drive down, spend the day with you and Josie, and then drive you up. Uh, I'd love you to meet a friend of mine, a guy called Francis Chan. I don't know if you've met him. I don't know if you know, know of him. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. I'd love to, you guys to have the day together, meet him and his wife, Lisa. I was like, what? Francis Chan? Like, yes, I've heard of Francis Chan. And it was the exact afternoon when I'd already felt the Holy Spirit shift something, saying, now you can start. It was really remarkable. And um, 
And so um, this, this, was gonna, this was coming up on a Saturday. And also on the Sunday, uh, another, a whole other story. I'm giving you the very brief version, believe it or not. There, a friend of ours called Joe, who'd been in the UK, had been a guitarist in a band for a college ministry conference I did for 10 years in the UK. He was the guitarist in the band. He had moved to San Francisco five years ago, and he was like a, a vague friend, lovely friend, if you ever listen to this, Joe. But at that point, I didn't know him, know him. But when we got up at Christmas, we needed somewhere to stay, and I just Facebooked Joe. I was like, hey, Joe, any chance we could, we could stay? And he was like, of course! And uh, when we got there, to my great surprise, he's not just a guitarist and also like a, a computer man. He... Um, he was about to become an elder at the one church that several people had mentioned called Reality Church, which is this very radiant type word and spirit church. And I was like, that's really weird. So over those days, I was like the one church I'd heard of, and he was, you know, g- going to become an elder there. So anyway, this weekend's coming up, this Saturday, where I'm going to have the day with Francis Chan, slightly terrifying, and on the Sunday... Coincidentally, this guy, Joe, was about to be installed as an elder. And Dave Lomas, who leads the church, was going to be laying hands on him. And then a guy called Britt Merrick, who started various reality churches around the world, was just happened to be there. And um, so on the Saturday, we go up, and I'm genuinely nervous, go into Francis Chan's house and uh, with my friend from England, who you know, makes the introductions. And, and I'm obviously keeping every, you know, I've told my friend now about the possibility of, of, of what God might be saying. And we're sitting in the lounge, and then Francis says, so Tom, Rob tells me you're going to be church planting in San Francisco. Tell us the story. With his whole extended family, or they'll all go, all go quiet and lean in. And I'm like, okay. So I start to talk to them about what I've, I felt the Spirit might be saying. And to my great surprise, he, the whole, all of them were beaming, saying, man, we really need all the help we can get. This place sounds cool and everything, but it is hard spiritually. If God is in this, we are so pleased. Come, and anything we can do to help, we'll do. I'm like, thank you, Lord. That's so encouraging. Then on the Sunday, go to Reality Church. My friend's becoming an elder. I'm like, yeah, go on, Joe. And I'm a bit of a, you know, I can be a bit of a kind of networker type guy. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to be Tom. Uh, however, before the meeting, Dave Lomas, who leads the church, who moved from Bakersfield 10 years ago and started it from scratch, and it's now boomed to this great church, he comes straight over to me. And I'm standing there with my friend Joe, and Joe says, oh, hi, Dave, this is Tom. He's going to start a church in San Francisco. <laughs> like, Joe, shut up, for goodness sake. It's an idea. It may, be, may happen. God might be speaking. I'm not sh- and he just blows my cover immediately. But, but then Dave is like, great. We really need all the help we can get. He talks to his PA, he says, Candace, can you, can you make sure we have lunch soon? I, we really want to get behind this. Anything we can do to help? I'm like, thank you. That's amazing. Anyway, this guy, Britt Merrick, who's kind of the father figure for all these reality churches, is there. He preaches a great sermon, but I'm not, I'm not going to go and talk to him. I'm just going to go home and, you know, ponder. And um, anyway, the, the auditorium clears. I go to the restroom. I'm in there. There's no one in there. And I finish being in the restroom. I turn around. <laughs> I turn around, and I literally bang into Britt Merrick. He just wanders in, and he's like, oh, sorry. And I'm like, oh, sorry, mate. And he's like, oh, you're British. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. He's like, how come you're here? And I'm like, oh. Uh, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, tell him. So I started to tell him. I said, look, this is a bit of a long story, but the quick version is. And I think we, we might feel God is potentially speaking to us about coming. As I'm telling him this story, he starts to cry in the restroom. He's like, yeah okay, this is amazing. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, this is so exciting. And he gets out his flip phone, because he's notoriously private. His little flip phone says, give me your number. <laughs> Call me. Anything we can do to help, we want to do this. So this is like the weekend, just this weekend, just going to go and hang out there. And God's like connecting and apparently opening up all these doors. So then the summer comes, June, we go back to England, and then we come back. And, and we're like, okay, Lord, um, some, some, some here, you know, we discussed as leaders um, about if the shores were to plant, where could, where could it be a likely place to go? And one thought that we'd had was the central coast. So we, do, we go and do due diligence, and we go to the central coast, and I have lunch with a wonderful pastor there called Tom O'Leary, who leads a church of a mere 3,000 in San Luis Obispo in a city of 40,000. And we had this lunch, and the headline is, 
He doesn't say don't come, but it's evident that there are so many excellent Word and Spirit churches that are on mission now already. I come away with no rise of faith that this is like, oh yeah, they desperately need the shores. And I kind of, we crossed that off, to be honest with you. It was so helpful. And then, and then we did a similar thing a bit further up north um, in, uh, in, in Santa Cruz. And um, we went there and uh, we, 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 we did a similar thing. We came away with a similar conclusion. So we were, we were ruling stuff out. And at the same time, do you guys remember Venu? The Indian, wonderful man, he came, hooray! And the Indian, and, and Indian, uh, Vinu was here, simply, in theory, to have a sabbatical. And I know Vinu a tiny bit, but nothing more than that. And Vinu is an apostle, but he's also very prophetic. And he was taking his family up to San Francisco, and he texted me, because I'd mentioned that, um, I just said we'd been there and we'd gone to a church. He said, what was the name of that church again? I was like, oh, it's Reality Church. He was like, cool. He said, I said, oh, have a good time. Uh, we love that city. That's it. And then he texts me straight back. He says, well, maybe you should move there and start a church. And I'm like, what? I was in this McDonald's. And I was like, what? Ooh. And I was like, did, did you, why did you, why did you, why, why, why did you say that? You know? And he was just, I was like, were you joking? And he's like, I did an emoji face, but actually I was deadly serious. And I was like, Vinu. So I was like, Vinu, this is, this is fascinating that you would be so specific. So a few days later, I, I, I talked to him and said, look, the honest truth is, um, this, this seems to be what God might be saying, but I'm really a bit worried because I'm very close to Trav, and he's, the whole church has poured out there, given us the, the red carpet treatment, and, you know, I love this man particularly, and I'm just a bit nervous, you know, like, and he's like, leave it with me. And V knew, and his family were going to Disneyland with the Aiklands, and uh, a week later, they're in Disneyland, and uh, Vinu, his good friends with Trav, was like, hey, Trav, it's so amazing. He'd be burning with fire for the valley. Have you ever thought about the bigger cities as well? Any thoughts on that? And Travis said, well, Davinu, well, I have wondered if actually the shores should go to San Francisco. And Vinu texted me, you'll never believe what Travis just said. <laughs> and I was like, that's crazy. And then a few weeks later, we had an elders' night away up in, the, up in Heartland. And uh, Travis said, Tom, can you share with the team? And obviously, there's a lot going on right now, okay? There's a lot of changes. I, and so I was like, oh my goodness, what are the team going to, how are they going to receive this? You know, even Teleri is, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But I shared it in the way I'm trying to do today. And to my am- amazement and joy, nothing less than the Holy Spirit fell in that cabin. Travis was crying even more than usual, <laughs> prophesying about David and Goliath. Jared was on fire, Mark was on fire, Lara was on fire, and I had it all recorded. I'm clever. I was like drinking it in. But it, honestly, I want to be a man who's accountable. I want this to be an us thing. It matters. I don't want it to be like we're just doing this thing. It's got, and so that was a massive thing for me. And then the week after, we were at this Confluence core team thing in Dallas. And Trav and and the guy got me to share there. And again, the spirit fell. And there wasn't a sense of, what? There was a sense of, yeah, come on. God's God's calling us to to believe for this. And so this was all happening. And and at the same time, as I say, there was this sort of sense of almost like a Macedonian call in a way. I kept on, I'm giving you the quick version. There was various other pastors who randomly I ended up connecting with who were all kind of saying, Tom, please come. There's no scrap of defensiveness, no scrap of, we've, we're fine, thank you. There's enough good churches here. There was an absolute, please come. We really need the power of the Spirit. We need, we need what God's put into you guys. And, um, and we had a trip in uh, August where we just were like, Lord, me and Joseph were like, Lord, if this is right, our kids have been through a lot of change. We really don't want to get this wrong. Um, and I, one of our big hearts was, Lord, would you just over these three days really just confirm it somehow? And the first day, the Thursday, I remember we went into the city um, and we, we got on the bus and we made uh, lots of wrong turns. And, you know, it was this long day like on public transport in the city. And at the end of it, like, the, the underground broke in the center. So we had to get on this big sweaty bus and everyone was crowded. And there was lots of fruity language, shall we say. And I was like, you know, 
And then it was about 8.30 at night, and our kids had been like on the road in SF all day. And I looked at these three little gorgeous cherubs, Daisy, Lily, and Poppy, at the back, surrounded by everyone else hanging onto the bus, you know. <laughs> and I just looked at them and was like, are you okay? And they were like, yeah, we're okay, Dad. And I just remember thinking, God, you're amazing. You're amazing. They're not freaking out. I remember the next morning, I was in bed, and one of my darling daughters, who's particularly change adverse, clambered into bed with me, and she just said, Daddy, do you think Jesus might be calling us to move to San Francisco? And I tried to not react. I was like, oh, no, maybe. What do you think? And she said, I think he is. I think he is. And over those days, we had... Um, so many ongoing coincidental things happen. We uh, we had had the briefest of connections with uh, Phil and Hannah Walker, who are here today. Um, a British couple have been in SF for 12 years at this event, and um, and we just thought, well, we'll just give them a quick text, see if they're around. And Hannah was around, and we met her at a coffee shop, and we basically talked over each other for half an hour because of our excitement and it was just crazy connections like she'd been discipled by an older couple called Derek and Joan Reynolds who are in their 80s now and they're some of our uh, eight, 70s? 70s sorry Joan's in her 70s Derek's in his 80s uh, and they they led the church that, that Hannah was at and discipled her and they're some of our best friends from Canterbury it's just bizarre and um, it was just it was just a, a crazy time where <sighs> We kept on, uh, we, we, we said goodbye to, to Hannah. She went off to get her son. And we're like, that, was, that, was, that felt like we'd known her for a long time. And Hannah was saying, we really need churches full of the Holy Spirit in the city. We really need churches that are actually got families in them. People who are willing to put roots down because it's such a transient city. Everyone comes and gets and goes. We really do need that. And we're like, that's, that's interesting. We went our separate ways, off into the city. About an hour later, we're at some very random part of Golden Gate Park, a play structure, and who do we see across the other side? Hannah. She's there, again, it's bizarre, so we go over and we, we chat, and um, she's got her three friends there, her mums, and Hannah immediately introduces me and says, oh, this is Tom, he's come to church plant here in San Francisco, and I'm like, ha, ah, thanks Hannah, and amazingly they're like, oh wow, what values, what are your values, talk to us about your values, and I'm like, values, gosh, would not be the question, the response rather, that you get in England. What are your values? Um, and basically, so many different things have kept happening. I could talk for a long time, but I'm trying to gauge how much is helpful. But I'm, I'm trying to help you to understand, I think, um, it has been a little bit of an avalanche over the last six months, a bit of an ambush of incredible, I think, confirmatory connections and relationships both with people on the ground there, pastors who are, again, just saying, whatever we can do, we really want to help you do this. And um, really, with very few times up in the city, what God's kind of been doing is gathering what could become a bit of a core group. And what's amazing is in the UK, with just one or two conversations with people very much on the low who have known our story, who have asked, hey, you're in California, what are you doing next? It's incredible. There's currently now somewhere between two and four families who are either definitely wanting to come or who are very seriously considering it and sorting out visas. And we're just like, we've, we've done virtually nothing strategic <laughs> to make any of this happen, which just makes us feel like this seems to be what the Lord is saying. And just one final story is that um, it was quite extraordinary. A friend of mine... Um, woke up and he had this very vivid picture of red bricks and water. And he said, I feel this is for you. And he would Googled that in San Francisco, after the great fire of 1906, when the city was leveled, there were all these circular red bricked cisterns built underground, filled with water. So that if there was another fire, they could very quickly respond. He said, most people don't know what these red brick circles are on the ground. And that's what they are. And I feel God saying to you, there's all this untapped living water, ready to go, this huge potential in the city. It's right there. They don't even know it's there. And I sent this to these guys, guys in SF, and I sent it to the guys in the UK. I was like, this is great. And everyone was very excited. Like, this is so helpful. 
what was really spooky was what then one of the guys in, in England, he said, this is crazy. He said, a few weeks ago, I was out running. And, uh, this is, and he lives in a city near London called Chatham. And he had to stand and ten, for 10 minutes and just show the runners where to go. And as he was standing there, he noticed this old plaque in the middle of nowhere. And it said, here lies the site where the bricks were made that were sent to San Francisco after the Great Fire a <laughs> hundred years ago. And he felt like he had this huge, like, what the heck. He took a photo of it, and he felt God say to him, what I did in the natural realm a hundred years ago, sending bricks from this city near London to San Francisco, I'm going to do through you and your wife in the rebuilding of that city in the spiritual realm. <laughs> So I share this here, and this guy in the UK is freaking out. I mean, how weird and specific. Red bricks that built cisterns that no one knows about. And God had spoken to him 6,000 miles away weeks earlier saying that exact same thing. So you see, I think we kind of sense like, I don't want to waver with this. I don't want to waver with this. So just very quickly then, why today? Number one, we, our kids know they're not great at keeping secrets. Okay? <laughs> Number two, honestly, some of you will be called by God to come with us. That's what the elders feel. That's what we are hoping and praying for. It may not be many, but we feel that if there's even one of you who God's going to call, it's a, big, it's a big step, and having some time to ponder, to think, to look into jobs, it's going to take time. Thirdly, actually, we just want to be honest, and actually it helps us, each of us, know how to relate. What box, box do you put the shores in? Are they going to buy a house and be here forever? Or are they going to be just up the road for a long time and be very connected? I think it just helps all of us, doesn't it? If we know exactly what things are going on. So that's why we're sharing today. What does it mean finally for us and Radiant? I think, first of all, can I give you a charge? A don't. Please don't pull back from us. We need you. You are family. And we're trying to be obedient to what we think God's doing. And I know some of you will be like, What? Scumbag, I thought you were staying here. <laughs> Listen, please, we're not, that far, we're not going to be that far away. And it's still nine months away. And we are learning like crazy. We are in like a, we are learning so many things. And if you did pull back, you are depriving us of incredibly important organic training that's happening. I really mean that. You are teaching us all the time we need that. Do come with us in your hearts. Come with us. This is, this is an us thing, okay? The Spirit is saying this is an us thing. He's confirming it. This is, this is a, a massive sense of, what's the word? Um, praise and honor that this church is not just some random church. In Vice. This church has something that that city desperately needs. I, w- I mean that with all my heart. There's some great churches, don't get me wrong. But I want you to understand this is, this is an us thing. If we've got any chance of seeing this Goliath that is SF, we, we need you guys to be with us in prayer, in hearts, in body, mind, spirits. We, need you, we just need you to come with us in that broad sense. And there's one final specific way in which I just want to put it into your calendars today. On the 1st of December, we've got a prayer and possibly day up in uh, San Francisco. Two categories. Those of you who just want to come and pray with us. There's no scrap of chance you want to come and and be with us and and start a new church up there. That's fine. We still desperately would love you to come and to pray with us. There may be those of you who also go, well, there's maybe a half a percent chance that we might feel that actually God's calling us to come with you and to do it. Come as well and walk the streets and be with us as we pray for a church that would connect with the poor and the powerful. We want to see a radiant type church up in the bay. We're very excited about that. Guys, thank you for listening. I'm going to hand it to Travis, who's going to say a few words as well. Bless you. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time.
to find Oh, I love the flowers and trees And the smell of the grinding sea And all the beautiful things here 